Welcome back to the Deep Dive. Today we're plunging into something pretty significant, a shift that's uh, definitely sending ripples through the tech world, especially if you're working with Kubernetes. We are talking about Bitnami. And yeah, some recent really pivotal changes that are making a lot of developers, a lot of DevOps teams, fundamentally rethink their strategies. So our mission for this Deep Dive is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. We want to unpack exactly what Bitnami was, why these recent changes are you know, so impactful, and critically, what practical options are actually available now for people who relied so heavily on its convenience. Our guide for this is a great document called Migrating Away from Bitnami, Alternatives, Challenges, and Lessons Learned. So yeah, if you've ever deployed complex applications, maybe surprisingly easily in Kubernetes, chances are you've bumped into Bitnami. But now, that convenience, it's changing and it's uh, it's definitely causing a stir. That's exactly it. You know, Bitnami wasn't just like another player in the Kubernetes space. For so many teams, it was genuinely a cornerstone. It gave them those essential building blocks, right? Quick deployments, consistent security updates, those ready to go turnkey Helm charts that just worked. For countless developers and DevOps teams, Bitnami wasn't just something they used. It was uh, deeply woven into their workflows, their automation, even their security policies. So yeah, this isn't just some minor annoyance. For some folks, it's a full-blown infrastructure rethink, and it's their core operations. Okay, so let's really unpack this. For anyone listening who maybe didn't live and breathe Bitnami daily, what exactly was it? And what made it so incredibly popular? What problems did it solve so well? Well, Bitnami's main draw was its... Um, simplicity and reliability. Just imagine having prepackaged Helm charts for literally hundreds of open source apps. Everything from databases like Redis and PostgreSQL to messaging queues, monitoring tools, even like entire application stacks. Before Bitnami, right, if you wanted PostgreSQL in Kubernetes, you often had to write your own YAML, figure out storage, configure security, and kind of hope you got it right. Bitnami just took all that complexity and bundled it up into a single trusted Helm install command. You could spin up a production-ready Redis cluster or uh, a, a whole Prometheus monitoring setup in minutes, not hours or days. Wow, yeah. That sounds almost too good to be true. Was it just about making things easier or there's there deeper technical reasons it became so indispensable? Oh, absolutely deeper benefits. Beyond just convenience, Bitnami delivered really consistent configurations. This meant, you know, no matter which app you grabbed from their catalog, you could expect a pretty similar structure, a similar upgrade path, fewer nasty surprises when you had to upgrade apps or Kubernetes itself. Fewer headaches, basically. Exactly. And crucially, Bitnami provided security-hardened images. Often, these images were actually better maintained with more proactive updates, quicker vulnerability patches than what the upstream projects shipped themselves. Plus, they were really early adopters of Kubernetes best practices. Things like uh, consistently providing rootless, distroless images. Rootless, distroless. Okay, we hear those terms a lot with security. Can you maybe give us a quick breakdown of why that's such a big deal? Sure. So rootless just means the application inside the container isn't running as the super user, root. That's a huge security win because if an attacker compromises the app, they don't immediately get full control of the container. It limits the blast radius. Got it. Less power for the bad guys. Right. And distrellus means the container images only have the app and its direct dependencies. No extra operating system stuff like shells or package managers. This massively shrinks the attack surface because there are just fewer things in there that could have vulnerabilities. Bitnami's focus on this stuff really aligned with best practices, giving teams, you know, peace of mind. Okay, so Bitnami was this super convenient, secure, reliable backbone for so many teams. But that magic, that convenience you mentioned, that's exactly what's changing now. What, what actually happened? Why did this send such a uh, chill through the community? Yeah, the chill really comes down to a corporate acquisition. Broadcom bought VMware and VMware owned Bitnami. And now Broadcom is, well, effectively pulling the plug on the free Bitnami images and charts. They're not going to provide those free continuously updated artifacts anymore. Essentially, the business model flipped. Convenience and robust maintenance, they don't always pay the bills after a big acquisition like that. And uh, they're taking Bitnami down a commercial path. It's kind of a classic story in open source, unfortunately. The free lunch, especially for production grade, constantly updated stuff, well, it's over. Right. That convenience, now gone. It, it, it leaves a pretty big hole. Mm -hmm. But what does this actually mean for the teams on the ground? What's the practical fallout here? Because it sounds like more than just, oh, that's annoying. Oh, it's way more than annoying. It creates, I'd say three big buckets of problems. First, there's a very real operational risk. 
When container images stop getting updates, especially security patches, they immediately become, well, ticking time bombs. Security mm -hmm. liabilities, just think about it, right? A zero day vulnerability pops up in a core library, like, I don't know, log4j or something in a database. If patches aren't applied, your whole stack could be exposed in hours. Dairy stuff. Totally. Kubernetes clusters are really only as secure as the stuff running on them. Outdated images aren't just a potential problem, they're often the first thing attackers look for. Could lead to data breaches, compliance fines, you name it. The clock starts ticking the second those updates stop. Okay, so a security nightmare waiting to happen. What about just the sheer work involved in moving away? And that's the second big issue. Massive migration overhead. Teams are now facing this immediate challenge. Find alternatives, or for some things, maybe build and maintain their own images from scratch. And this isn't just a simple find and replace job, you know. Mm -hmm. Bitnami charts had their own specific way of handling configurations, parameters. Loan values, the YAML structure and everything. Exactly. Migrating means you've got to adapt to totally different configuration standards, figure out new values, YAML files, maybe rewrite big chunks of your automation, your Helm overrides, your CICD pipelines, untangling years of custom configs, that can be a huge job. Lots of retesting needed. So a major drain on resources then, time people. Absolutely, which brings us straight to the third point, fragmentation. Bitnami gave everyone a single, consistent, sort of well-understood standard for deploying tons of different apps. It was like a central source of truth. Without that pillar, the ecosystem splinters. Now you're looking at official upstream charts, maybe community forks, maybe DIY solutions. Each with its own quirks. Right. It just adds layers of complexity for teams. And as one engineer put it online, pretty bluntly, we're already spread thin. At least maybe this will be encouragement to bring more hands on board. Yeah, that quote really hits home. Mm -hmm. It shows the human strain, right? This urgent, unplanned migration just dropped in their laps. Exactly. But okay. Amidst all this disruption, there is some good news. You're not completely stuck. There are solid alternatives out there. But yeah, the best choice really depends on what you're using Bitnami for, your specific situation. So where do teams even start looking? Okay. Let's start with probably the most obvious path for the really common stuff. Official Helm charts and images. For the big names, you know, things like Redis, PostgreSQL, the Prometheus stack, mm. the official open source projects often maintain their own charts and container images. Uh. So, for instance, there's the official Redis chart, which is pretty solid. Or for production PostgreSQL, you might look at something like the cloud native PG operator that's gaining a lot of traction. And the Prometheus community has comprehensive Helm charts for their whole monitoring ecosystem. These are generally reliable, but... Um, there are trade-offs. They might not have quite the same polish Bitnami added, maybe not the same security defaults out of the box, or those rootless configurations we talked about. You might need to do a bit more hardening yourself. Right, so potentially more security work for the teams, even using official stuff. What about efforts to kind of, I don't know, keep the Bitnami way going? Yeah, that's where community forks of Bitnami enter the picture. These are basically grassroots efforts trying to keep Bitnami-compatible images and charts alive. We're seeing projects like BitCompat pop up on GitHub trying to offer similar images for critical services. And there are individual maintainers, um, like 11 Notes is one name that comes up, who are creating these optimized, minimal rootless images to replace specific Bitnami ones. The catch, though, it's a bit like the Wild West. While these efforts are fantastic, often filling a huge gap, you do have questions about trust, about long-term maintenance, about longevity. It's a big concern. That makes total sense. I saw one skeptical comment that really nailed this point. Say you get hacked. All your images may get compromised, and the damage is much bigger and widespread. Now, obviously, that risk exists anywhere, but it feels amplified when you're relying on maybe one person or a small group doing it for free. Right. It absolutely is amplified. Look, the risk of a supply chain attack is always there. But with a big organization like Bitnami under VMware, you had sort of an implicit level of trust in their processes, their vetting, their patching cadence. When you rely on a single person or a small unfunded community group, the bus factor is high. The resources for rigorous security audits, for rapid patching, for long-term commitment, they're often just not there. It's definitely a trade-off. Convenience versus potential risk. Okay. And then there's what some people are calling the nuclear option. Sure. Roll your own. Basically building and maintaining your very own container images from scratch, taking full ownership. What's the upside there? And what's the presumably massive downside? The upside is pretty clear, and it's compelling for some. You get total control. Security, 
image size, configuration, dependencies, you dictate every single detail. You make sure it perfectly matches your company's policies, your compliance needs. You're not dependent on any outside vendor or community. Total independence. Right. But the downside is equally clear, and yeah, it's often daunting. It demands significant time, specialized skills, and just ongoing effort. For teams managing dozens, maybe hundreds of services, this can honestly feel like trying to build the engine while the plane's already in the air. It's a fundamental shift in who's responsible. Yet, I've seen some engineers framing this as almost a necessary step, maybe even liberating. Like one person said, might be a good time to gather all the resources and start making your own. Time for a little independence. If you don't go down this path, what becomes absolutely critical? Automation. Automation becomes your absolute lifeline. You need solid CICD pipelines. Pipelines that automatically build your images, test them, scan them for vulnerabilities, deploy them, check them against your standards. It has to be automated. It's not just nice to have. It's essential. Essential for keeping your sanity, ensuring consistency, and just maintaining security at scale. Without really strong automation, rolling your own can quickly turn into a manual error-prone mess. Makes sense. And okay, regardless of the long-term plan, official community DIY, is there anything teams can do right now to just buy themselves some breathing room? Yes, absolutely. And this is a crucial immediate step. Private registries and caching. If you depend on Bitnami images today, you should be caching them internally, like now. Tools like Harbor or Artifactory or other container registries can store copies of the Bitnami images you currently use. So you have your own copy. Exactly. Now, this doesn't solve the long-term problem. Hmm. You still need updates eventually, but it buys you critical time, weeks, maybe months. Time to plan your migration, evaluate the alternatives we talked about, phase in new solutions without your current deployments just suddenly breaking, like one user put it pretty bluntly. Guess that is gonna have to change, and it may have to cache their images and charts on my own harbor instance. Yeah. It's just a pragmatic, short-term fix to avoid immediate chaos. Smart, a necessary stopgap. Definitely. But let's be clear, moving away isn't just about picking a new image. There are some significant hurdles beyond just choosing an alternative. One big one is configuration drift, the way you set up your apps in Helm. It might not map directly to the new charts. Different charts have different values. Uh, YAML structures, you know, the th settings you customize, like database passwords, replica accounts, resource limits. All that stuff you carefully tuned over time. Precisely. Your existing Helm overrides, which teams rely on heavily to tailor things, might need major rewrites, maybe even a complete overrides. Overhaul. That means a ton of testing. Oof. Yeah, that sounds like a potential rabbit hole for dev and ops teams. What about security? Especially for those who really leaned on Bitnami's hardened images. That leads right into security trade-offs. A lot of official images, unlike Bitnami's usual approach, still run as root by default, or they don't have distraless builds readily available. So if you've built your security policies, maybe your runtime security tools, your whole compliance stance around Bitnami's rootless, distraless way of doing things, switching to a less secure default image could feel like a big step backward. A regression, yeah. It forces you to reevaluate your security baseline, maybe do a lot of extra work hardening images yourself or updating policies. It's not trivial. And then there's operational complexity, especially for less common apps. Think about things like uh, OpenLDGAP, maybe Apache ActiveMQ, some niche monitoring tools. Right, not the big marquee names. Exactly. For those, robust, well-maintained alternatives might just not exist, not in the official space, not in the big community efforts. This pushes teams squarely towards roll your own or relying on smaller community forks, which like we said, have their own risks and overhead. Many teams just aren't set up for that. And finally, there's always the challenge of organizational buy-in. Selling this migration effort to management, that can be tough. Getting the resource at the time. Yeah, convincing stakeholders that this isn't just extra tech work or some team's preference, it's critical risk mitigation. It's a strategic investment to keep the infrastructure stable and secure. That framing is really important. You mentioned OpenLD, and that brings us to a really thorny area. What about OpenLD and other edge cases? This feels like where things get genuinely messy. For popular stuff like Redis or Postgres, like you said, there are usually options. But for something like OpenLDF, totally different ballgame. I saw a sysadmin in a forum post who just nailed it. In my case, the one that stands out most is OpenLDF, which is hard to come by. All the images I've went through before Bitnami are either unmaintained, unstable, or both. Rrr. Wow. That really highlights the challenge for these specific, sometimes older, but still critical services where the ecosystem just isn't as rich. I mean, imagine if your whole internal authentication relies on OpenLD app and poof, your trusted source for container images vanishes. Huge problem. 
it is a huge problem. For those edge cases, the options are, yeah, they're pretty grim, often requires a whole strategic rethink. Maybe you need to switch to a compatible alternative entirely, like a 389 directory server, but only if that's even feasible. It might need big application changes. Or you're firmly in roll your own territory for open LDOP. That's a massive undertaking. It's complex, needs real expertise to secure and manage a directory service properly. Not something you do casually. Not at all. The third option is pinning your hopes on a community fork. Joining it, maybe contributing, and just hoping it lasts and stays maintained. But you're accepting that increased risk. The bottom line is, None of these are quick fixes, and if you're running legacy software that doesn't easily support modern auth like OIDC or SAMLO, your choices get even narrower. It could force a much bigger migration of your whole identity strategy. Wow. Yeah, a real ripple effect. Definitely. And ultimately, this whole Bitnami situation, it's more than just a migration headache for certain apps. It really is a significant reality check for how we all consume open source software. It forces us to look at the bigger picture. And the hard truth is, well, free isn't forever, especially for something as comprehensive and critical as Bitnami became. You could argue Bitnami's model was never really sustainable long term without some kind of commercial backing eventually. I mean, think about it. Hundreds of charts, thousands of images constantly adapting to rapid Kubernetes API changes. A huge maintenance burden. Immense. All for a massive user base expecting it for free. That's often a recipe for maintainer burnout or, like we saw here, an acquisition followed by a paywall. Someone commented online pretty wisely, I thought, Bitnami was always doomed to grow too big for their own good. The nature of what they do was never going to end up profitable. It just highlights that fundamental tension in open source. That's a really powerful point and yeah, sobering. So what do we take away from this mm -hmm. as an industry, as individual teams? What are the key lessons here moving forward? Okay, lesson one, and this is huge. Don't outsource your entire infrastructure strategy to a single free vendor. Bitnami was an amazing convenience, a great crush. Relying solely on it created this single point of failure that, well, many are feeling acutely now. Diversify. Understand your supply chain. Makes sense. Don't put all your eggs in one free basket. Exactly. Lesson two, plan for churn. Open source moves fast. Tools come and go. Projects rise and fall. That's just the nature of the ecosystem. Your automation, your processes, they need to be designed to make migrations easier, not harder. That means good documentation, modular automation, really understanding your dependencies. Be ready for change. Be ready. And finally, lesson three. If you can, contribute back. If the community really values these tools, this convenience, then the community has to help share the load. Whether that's code, docs, testing, even financial support sometimes. It can't always fall on one company or a handful of volunteers doing it for free. Right. Share the responsibility if you share the benefit. Okay. So what's the bottom line here? The end of free Bitnami. Yeah. It's definitely going to be painful for a lot of people. It's extra work. It's unplanned. It can feel overwhelming. But it's important to remember. It's not the end of the world, right? It's not the apocalypse. It's actually a critical moment, a chance to rethink your whole approach to deploying apps and managing infrastructure, whether that means leaning more on official charts, carefully vetting and maybe embracing community forks, or finally making that big investment in automation to truly own your deployment stack. This is a real opportunity for growth, for more resilience, Exactly. The container ecosystem itself, it's still incredibly strong, innovative, constantly evolving. This whole situation is just a powerful reminder, really, a reminder that nothing stays free forever, especially at production scale. And that convenience, while super helpful short term, often comes with these hidden long term costs that maybe you don't see at first. The good news is, with the right strategy, a proactive approach, really committing to understanding and managing your dependencies, you absolutely can turn this disruption into a long term win for your organization. It forces a strategic review that honestly probably needed to happen anyway and will make your infrastructure stronger in the end. Indeed. It feels like the era of just blindly relying on someone else's free time for your core yeah. production yeah. infrastructure. Yeah. That's truly over. So the question for you listening is, what's your plan? Are you going to cache those Bitnami images and ride it out for a bit? Are you jumping to official charts? embracing a community fork, or maybe this is the push you needed to go the DIY route, build that internal expertise, really think about it. What's your strategy for truly owning your stack moving forward? Lots to consider. We'll catch you on the next deep dive.